Hi, my name is Dr. Jeff Foster. I am a GP with a specialist interest in men's health. Uh, I've been a doctor for just off 20 years and I have a subspecialty in male health. It means I specialize in areas such as testosterone deficiency, erectile dysfunction, prostate disease in men. Uh, I sit on the committee for the British Society of Sexual Medicine and we write the sort of national gold standard guidelines for things like testosterone and male hormone health. Today, we're going to be looking at uh, testosterone deficiency in men, something that a lot of guys have not really heard about, but it's actually way more common than we think. And it's something we probably should be thinking about more as we start to get older. So um, when we think about testosterone, we most commonly associate testosterone largely as just something about getting more stacked and muscly at the gym and of course, sexual function but it does way, way more. And it's really important in terms of our general health and well-being. The problem with testosterone, again, is it's often dismissed in primary care. So if you go to a GP, we don't really know, we don't really address testosterone much in general practice. Often patients don't think about it as much um, in terms of their general health and well-being, and it tends to be associated with, again, sex and gyms, but we don't think about it in other forms of health or demographics. Because of that, if your GP doesn't think about it much and because patients don't think about it much, it kind of gets pushed to the back and we don't often test for it. It's such a major issue that actually we test more women for testosterone levels in terms of polycystic ovaries and menopause treatments than we do for men. So, for example, in my NHS practice, we have 16,000 patients and we have significantly more female patients that have been tested for testosterone than men in themselves, which is absolutely crazy when you think about it. And it's only in the private work, um, which is our company, where we really focus on trying to optimize the male health aspect of low testosterone, which changes as we get older. So intro out the way, what is low testosterone or testosterone deficiency? And it's had various terms in the media. Uh, it's been dubbed uh, male menopause, menopause. God, that one got on my nerves, andropause. But the, the actual real terminology is testicular hypogonadism. The problem is, of course, no blokes really want to be told they've got hypogonads. So generally, the term testosterone deficiency is kind of stuck as the main terminology we use. The clinical definition is just a failure of your testicles to produce enough testosterone to provide normal function, either to produce sperm or to provide the benefits that your body needs to function on a day to day basis that you need as a guy to have testosterone and be masculine. Um, so in terms of numbers, uh, this is where, again, it's actually way more common than you think. About 12% of men over 50 will suffer symptoms. 50% of type 2 diabetics have it. And that's just an enormous number, but we don't really screen for it. And a quarter of all men at some point in their lives will have low testosterone. Now, it doesn't mean that all guys are going to need treatment but we need to be thinking about the fact that a quarter of all men are gonna have low testosterone. So you naturally peak your testosterone at the end age of about uh, 30, and then you lose about 1% every year and it just trickles down over time. And if you're really lucky, you might have a really high level to start with and be absolutely fine and never know, you just carry on through life, you're doing really well. If you were naturally born with maybe a little less testosterone, or maybe you had another medical problem or other things got in the way, and I'll come back to that in a minute, then your testosterone levels can drop at a much earlier age. And the problem with testosterone, this is why I put this graph up of your uh, little picture, sorry, of your brain and your pituitary and your testicles, is because lots and lots of things impact on your testosterone and your ability to produce the stuff. So the picture shows your brain, uh, which is your hypothalamus in the middle, and that secretes a hormone called GnRH, which then goes down to your pituitary gland, which is still in your brain. Although oddly, the pituitary gland I've got here looks like a set of testicles it's not supposed to it's just your pituitary gland uh, and then that goes down to your testicles which then secrete testosterone and provide a negative feedback to your brain and the whole loop goes around but lots and lots of things we do as guys impact on our ability to keep this loop healthy and i'll come on to that in a bit so supposing we said well a quarter of all guys are going to get low testosterone well what are the symptoms um so generally the easiest way to think about the symptoms of low testosterone in men are the fact that they are virtually identical to menopausal symptoms in women. And my big argument all the time is that men and women are not that different uh, when it comes to hormone health. And yes, menopause is a loss of estrogen and women feel terrible and we go through menopause and they have all these discussions around menopause and HRT and it's really topical at the minute. 
exactly the same thing happens to men. The problem is, of course, we don't know what age it's going to be and we don't know how bad it's going to be. And it makes it a little harder to pick up. So symptoms of low testosterone, well, men get more grumpy. They get more tired. They lose their enthusiasm and drive for life. They lose their enjoyment in their job or spending time with their family. They start to become physically different. So they find it harder to gain uh, muscle or do well in the gym. You often feel like you're training just as hard, but the muscle's not coming on. You're just getting fatter and for your body changes. Uh, you start to get a loss of libido and you might get erectile dysfunction, but that's more of a severe symptom at the end. Most of the guys really in the early stages just start to find they're just less interested in sex. And if you put that all together, that's often confused with just being a middle-aged guy. So if you think about it, the average guy in his 40s or 50s, well, they often aren't as athletic as they were in their 20s. They're a bit more tired. Their family gets in the way. They don't have much time to themselves. They might be a little less motivated to do things. Their job's boring. Their kids keep them up all night. Wife's been married for 12, 15 years. So you don't want to have sex anymore. So all this kind of stuff is considered normal because it's a normal thing for a middle-aged guy. And don't get me wrong, for 75% of men, that is normal. It's all, at least it's their middle age. But of course, for a quarter of all men, it's not. And this is a medical thing that we need to be treating because it can have big impacts on your health otherwise. So we often use this uh, screening question here, which is called the Adam score. And we use it to screen men who may or may not have a deficiency of testosterone. And basically, it's a very simple 10 point questionnaire. It involves around three basic areas of your health, the physical side. So we ask things like, you know, you're short of energy. Uh, are you finding that you're having a deterioration in sport? Are uh, you finding that your work performance isn't as good as it was? And we match that with the psychological or mental health side. Are you a bit more grumpy? Have you lost your enjoyment in life? Do you feel like things just aren't as exciting as they were before? Um, and then obviously we also add the sexual dysfunction side in terms of erectile dysfunction and libido. It's, it's a quite a broad screening tool. And of course, you're going to have other problems that could also come back positive. But it's a really useful marker just to give you that indication. Say, well, hang on a minute. I've got three, four, five, six points on this. Then it leaves you an idea to go get that test. So um, when we talk about causes of low testosterone, and we're going back to that kind of picture that I showed you at the beginning with the brain and the pituitary and the testicles and the testosterone going round. Um, as I said, every guy is going to start to drop his testosterone as they get older. But the problem is, as per that graph, lots and lots of other things affect your testosterone. And this table is by no means exhaustive, but gives you an indication of just some of the other things that can impact on your testosterone production um, as a guy. So the most common we put is aging. And that's clearly the most common cause. The second most common cause is actually just body weight. And the optimal percentage of fat as a guy is about 10 to 15 percent, anything above, anything below. And it starts to impact on your testosterone. But but even more subtly, conditions like high blood pressure, type 2 diabetes, uh, asthma, even asthma does this. So really mild medical conditions that a lot of us have can impact on your testosterone from a lifestyle side, sleeping, uh, alcohol, lack of exercise, too much exercise. Um, other drugs, lots of medicines we give people, even over the counter ones. So things like uh, some of the antifungals we use, some of the painkillers we use, most of the mental health drugs, all of these can destroy your testosterone. And you can imagine that maybe if you just had a little bit of aging, so it's had a little impact on your testosterone, but then you add one or two of these others and it can have a big overall effect on your ability to keep your testosterone moving. So supposing you've done your Adam score, and you have a look at the results and you think, right, OK, uh, I've scored pretty high. Oh, yeah, I've got asthma. I'm a bit overweight. I'm 50. I do need to think about doing a test. What do you do? Well, diagnosis is actually really simple and it's based on a, a morning testosterone. It doesn't necessarily need to be fasting. Some of the studies suggest that it could be, but really it probably doesn't need to be fasting. It's, it's not essential. Um, now, the reason I put these numbers up is because they're actually pretty useful because the NHS criteria doesn't meet the gold standard. And admittedly, this can be considered a little controversial, but the again, the British Society of Sexual Medicine, uh, which writes a sort of gold standard for what testosterone levels should be in the UK. And it's a multidisciplinary team of urologists, endocrinologists, GPs, cardiologists, and we all wrote the guidelines together. We've basically said that it's a, if a guy has a level of less than 12, for their testosterone levels, we should consider them for treatment if they have symptoms. 
If it's above 15, then you probably don't need to. Um, if it's 15 or less and they've got diabetes, then we should also consider treatment. In the NHS, frustratingly, a lot of the reference ranges are set much lower. Now, these are just historical and hopefully they'll catch up at some point. But many, many patients are told actually your levels are seven or eight and therefore that's normal and they can't treat you in the NHS. But it doesn't mean that they're normal. It just means that the reference range hasn't been updated yet. So I would always say that if you're told your levels are normal, get the number and see what it actually means, because it might mean that you're still eligible for treatment. It might just be that currently that NHS area has a restricted reference range and can't offer you therapy. Um, there is a note about free testosterone. That's an entirely different discussion that I could do a 20 minute lecture on anyway. Um, and the free testosterone is just the available testosterone. So what I'd always just say in terms of that is if you have a normal testosterone results, but you have lots of symptoms, then ask for a free testosterone because it gives you a more um, accurate picture. If it's low, it's low to start with your total testosterone. It doesn't matter. But if you've got a normal level and you've got symptoms, it's worth just asking for a free testosterone and it will give you more information about what your levels really are. So uh, it's probably worth just briefly mentioning about what you can do yourself to try and improve your testosterone levels, because obviously in an ideal world, you don't want to be having to come and see me and sign to have a look at treatments. It'd be really nice if you could do things yourself to improve your testosterone, uh, because generally avoiding doctors is always a good thing. Um, so, uh, things you can do. Well, um, firstly, and I've kept this as a separate, but we mentioned body weight at the start and it is related to all these, but body weight is the biggest key. And really we know that men are with a, um, uh, body fat above 15%, they produce more estrogen and estrogen is a direct antagonist to testosterone. You want a bit of estrogen as a guy, just not too much. And too much is directly bad for testosterone. They don't really like each other. Um, you also produce insulin resistance effects as you become larger, and that has a negative effect on testosterone production. And really interestingly, is just as you become more overweight, it does directly impact on your testicles, shrinking the effect and reducing your testosterone. So a lot of guys will go, well, you know, and they look really big. It looks like their private areas have shrunk down a bit. And actually, that's probably true. Um, but it's all reversible, which is good stuff. So um, body weight is important. Exercise is very important as well. And the evidence seems to be that it doesn't really matter what type of exercise you do. It just needs to be intense. So three to four times a week, maybe 45 minutes is enough, but it needs to be something to get you out of breath or to make your muscles hurt or to make you feel tired afterwards. And I do get a little bit ratty with people go, well, I do lots of walking. That's great, but it's not, it's not exercise in the same way we would consider a metabolic stimulus. You know, you're not going to come back from a crocky, I'm sweating loads, I'm really tired and my muscles hurt. Because if you are, that, that's a worrisome sign anyway. But that's not the same. Um, diet's important. And we know that men have to have enough protein in their diet. Over the age of 40, we start to reduce our ability to absorb protein. And we often assume that's okay, but don't. Increase your protein intake, it makes a big difference. You must get six to seven hours sleep a night. And broken sleep is really, really negative in terms of producing testosterone. We naturally produce our testosterone in the early hours of the morning. And that's why guys get morning erections. So if you can't remember the last time you had a morning erection, that in itself is a red flag straight away. Now, I'm not suggesting it's like when you're 15 and, and the wind changes, you get an erection. We don't want that. But even from the age of 40, 50, 60, 70, you should get a morning erection a couple of times a week. And that's dependent on you getting a good night's sleep. The last possible area is, well, we say stress and stress releases cortisol, which antagonizes testosterone. But it's very easy for me as some patronizing doctor to say, well, you must reduce your stress. Uh, you know, it's, it's hard and life is difficult and we can't always do easy things to reduce our stress when we're stuck in the middle of a job or lifestyle that's difficult. But it's something just to be aware of. Um, there were some studies that showed that being sexually active could improve your testosterone, but it's probably not the case uh, because afterwards it appears that post um, orgasm most guys release prolactin and oxybutynin which act, uh, sorry uh, oxytocin which actually undoes some of the positive effects of the testosterone so probably not worth it and the other big thing i do mention is supplements because they are a total waste of money it's a two billion pound industry that is basically a con so don't go to supplement shops and start buying testosterone supplements because 99 percent of them don't do much and the couple that do aren't particularly well regulated so just best avoid if you do need to go on treatment for testosterone replacement therapy, it's very, very easy stuff. It's a gel or it's an injection. 
uh, and we don't use pills anymore because they weren't very good for the liver. We are thinking about using patches, but the gel you can put on every day, really easy, works very efficiently. The injections you can either do yourself every sort of 10 to 14 or 16 days, or you can have them done by your doctor once every nine to 12 weeks. So there's lots and lots of choices. And the best choice is actually the one that works for you. And there isn't one better than another. It's just about coming to that best choice, but it's easy stuff. So very briefly, because I'm aware of time, you need to look at the uh, benefits of testosterone and actually they're massive. Uh, and we get improved brain function. So reduction in brain fog, your motivation, your mood is better. There's a query about whether it actually reduces dementia risk in a similar way to HRT. So there's lots of positives about that, but probably needs a bit more work. Uh, improves your sex drive, sexual function improves, you improve your muscle mass, you reduce your body fat, you have more energy, you're more motivated. And then when it comes to health benefits overall, it reduces osteoporosis, reduces your risk of type 2 diabetes, improves your cholesterol, improves your um, blood pressure and your cardiovascular risk. So then you think, well, why isn't everyone diagnosed with low testosterone? Um, and interestingly, it's a relatively new area of medicine. So we've got more than 20 years data showing how good testosterone is and how important it is and how actually recently there's some studies that show that it's actually really healthy for lots of other things. But the problem is we have doctor and patient awareness, like I mentioned at the beginning. A lot of patients don't know about it. A lot of doctors don't know about it. So this is unconscious incompetence. We're not being checked very much. And then there's the comparison with menopause and women. So if you think about menopause 20 years ago there wasn't really meant much out there I didn't get taught menopause in med school and yet now you've got people like Davina who've been an amazing advocate for menopause on channel four whole documentaries on it um, and there are thousands and thousands of women going to their doctors asking about menopause treatments whereas uh, we've got me and that's me doing a talk at a local gym and clearly the guy at the bottom's literally just come out of the gym because he couldn't even be bothered to put a shirt on but um, you know, the, the comparisons are just stark. We don't really have any male advocates that are willing to talk about testosterone in the same way, which makes it really frustrating. So I guess the take home message is testosterone is more common than you think. And we should think about it in any guy over the age of 30 with mental health problems, loss of drive, loss of motivation, that, that uh, erectile dysfunction, tiredness, fatigue. Don't, don't assume it's normal for age. And it's also important to think testosterone is not designed to be a panacea for all male health. You can't treat everything with it, but um, when it's diagnosed properly, it can be a life-changing treatment. So why wouldn't we? Um, and the only other last thing to think about, especially for men that have partners that are menopausal or who are on HRT, the journey together is better when you feel the same. So if you both have hormone deficiencies, it's probably not so important because you're both grumpy and don't want to have sex. But if your partner starts HRT and she suddenly feels great and uh, wants to do things with you and, you're, and she feels more motivated and you don't have that, you can feel the difference becomes more stark. So if we can get HRT for women, then why on earth are we thinking more about testosterone for men? And um, I think that'd be the end of my talk. Thank you very much.